Okay, everybody, welcome to the Future of Recruitment uh, Blab, hosted by Firefresh Software and sponsored by PredictiveRecruitment.com. I'm your host, Cameron McLennan, and joining me today, we have Firefresh CEO, Wendy McDougall, and we have Bill Berman as well. Great, thanks very much. Bill, would you be able to tell the audience in the room um, a little bit about yourself, please? Yeah, yeah, I think I know most of the people in the room, actually, but um, I'm, I'm Bill Bourne, my background is I, I do a number of things. I'm the Managing Director of Innovation and Technology um, for Recruiting Daily, which means basically I, I look at all the new tech that's coming into the market and write reviews and white papers and things like that on, on technology that's going on. I do um, integrations with um, corporate organizations. So currently doing Bank of Ireland, which is technology and methodology. Um, as to how they're working moving forward, and also NASPA's group, which is probably the biggest internet company, sixth biggest internet company in the world that no one's ever heard of. We have uh, 150 companies in 125 countries. Um, so that, uh, and I deal with projects like that, usually two to three a year. I run true events, which means um, at the Recruiting Unconference, which you know we had uh, True Edinburgh recently. We're off to True Budapest. Tonight, I think a few people who are going are, are, are on the call, um, which is kind of the crazy circus we have going around the world talking about things. And I, I speak at a lot of events and I advise tech companies. So I kind of fit it all together. I'm a, I'm a recovering recruiter. So um, I was a recruiter for a lot of years. Um, and I, I'm now, I now say I'm involved at the strategic rather than the, the, the tactical end of recruiting. Fantastic. And Wendy, uh, I know a lot of people inside here will, will know yourself as well, but do you want to give the audience a little bit of background on, on yourself as well? Yep. Don't travel the world like Bill, um, but I'm CEO of Firefish Software. You did go to Edinburgh the other day. I, know I that. did. I did go out of Glasgow and I made it to Edinburgh. It was a great event. Um, yeah, no, so I'm CEO of Fire, Firefish Software now, but I'm an ex-recruiter. Um, set up uh, my own recruitment agency, successfully sold that and spun out what is now Firefish um, in 2010. So I'm really on a mission now um, to help recruiters reach more candidates, engage with them and make more placements. Um, so that's really what I spend my whole life doing. Fantastic. Um, I really want to get your uh, both of your opinions on the um what a new recruitment agency looks like. What should it look like? What should the structure be within that agency? What should the roles within it be? Um, so I'd be keen to get your, your views on that first, Bill. Well, I think that we're, we're in a bit of a battle. So, uh, you know, at the moment, I think for a lot of people, it's business as usual. I, I don't know whether that's necessarily a good thing. Um, I think that's being hugely encouraged by the trade associations and people kind of championing um, how great the sector is and how much the the, 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 the sector is uh, burgeoning and growing. Whereas I think that, that, that there's a lot of pressure um, coming in at the moment in terms of how they do business. What, what, what I see, and I know what prompted you um, wanting this, this conversation, what, what I see really coming is the way in which um, agencies make actually make their money and make their revenue, I think is significantly going to change over the next period of time in the way that lots of other things have been um, been been disrupted, part by technology and part by by method or, or, or different ways that people are working and connecting. And so I, I, I think when we, I know we've got a, a good mixed audience between agency recruit, recruiters um, and, uh, and uh, in-house and corporate recruiters and consultants listening in i think we really have to separate the two i think a lot when we talk about the future of recruiting we mix those two up between corporate and agency agency we really have to look at as supply chain as the top of the funnel i think the competition comes with job boards and linkedin and other means of supply of getting people at the top of the funnel i think the corporate in-house um, recruiting um future is something which is quite different but what about you, Wendy? What do you think? Well, I was just going to pick up on that. So when you say the top of the funnel there um, from the agency, yeah. um, can you can you expand on that? I mean, you're talking about, because I, I probably see it slightly differently. I, I'm not sure I see the agencies just coming into the top of the funnel and providing lots of candidates, because I kind of think that's the easy part. No, 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 what I mean by that, Wendy, is that that's, that's actually where the agencies live. 
So you know, we quite often make the mistake when we have we have this conversation of kind of saying it's um, it's agency versus in house when uh, that's kind of comparing apples with oranges. It's a completely yeah. different thing. I see um, I see agency or third party being the supply of candidates into the funnel, and if you look at where that supply um that supply of candidates come from and you can arg argue the merits of each one yeah that puts an, an agency or third party recruiter on a par with a job board or a the, channel okay or or a channel and, and that's really what that's really what an agency is it's a channel for candidates into the funnel so if we're going to so i'm going to sort of come from the agency part of part of it then if we're going to look at how we make that channel as effective and profitable as possible from their agency side. Um, what do you see the structure like that to, you know, what do you see, do you see that changing? Is it the same? As yeah, the well, I, I think ultimately we've got a, 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 a fee system in which value is being increasingly questioned. Yeah. I, I think the challenge, I think the challenge to the agency sector comes from a, a, a number of, comes in a number of directions and, has to be something that, that that's seriously talked about rather than rather than dismissed. I think one is um, that, that, that it, it certainly with some of the um, customers that I've worked with, every, part of what they've inevitably been doing is spending less and less on agency fees. Mm -hmm. um, and you, and in some cases, you're talking about millions rather than rather than thousands. Um, and the reason for that has been in part a question of value, which is comparing the agency channel with other channels and saying are we getting any more value against the increased cost of the return on investment we're spending x on this and why if we do it directly um are we getting any greater return on those people and that's that that's been highly questionable but mm -hmm. i think the other one is it is more to do with the way that people are increasingly looking for work so some of the things that we've found is that the average um, the average hire has been connected with an organization for seven months. Um, they've been following on Facebook or LinkedIn or Twitter. They've been having a relationship for a period of time. They're not being introduced to strangers. They're not two strangers meeting where we go, here's a company that you know nothing about and here's a candidate that you nothing, know nothing about. There's already a level of relationship going on and it's taking longer for people to become applicants to actually hit the apply button. They're, they're, consuming more stuff, following more more brands closely in terms of w w where they're going to work. And that's something that impacts on the corporate side of the business. And I think the two things we get down to is, right, we talk a lot now when we talk about branding as the important thing being, this, being storytelling. I don't think that actually applies as much as it's not the story, it's the teller who, who's actually doing the telling. Mm -hmm. um, and we've really had to look closely at whether – you can have a third party person telling your story for a period of time. So the whole yeah. um, branding and connecting relationship area and the lifelong candidate, as opposed to the transactional candidate who goes for a job and meets a stranger, um, it is really it is really changing. So we have to look at the third party agency model and say, is that geared for that space or is that geared for the relationship or is it geared for the transaction? And on the for the most part, what we're hitting is it's geared for the transaction. And that's the bit where I think needs a significant rethink and overhaul. And and at that, I would agree with you. I'm going to wear my hat now. So I can <laughs> yeah. I'm on par with you. Um, so I completely I agree. I think there's an the opportunity there, though, in terms of we are just like firing CVs out um, to a certain extent. And then. In, in enhancing this transaction but that whole branding piece and actually being able to tell that story I actually think that we've been you know agencies have been doing that for years and years and actually it's an undervalued story. I don't think they have I don't think they have Wendy I think that's 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 a fantasy to say that I might I might have to get Steve Ward and <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I don't yeah think okay and that's a good example so yeah. if we want to hold up a good example of people who do it well we can try out Steve Ward and say everything's okay because Steve does that. Steve does a does an exceptional job. I yeah. think we agree the reason Steve is successful and um, speaks at a lot of uh, uh, speaks at a lot of events and companies is Steve is an exception. Uh -huh. So you know I, I don't and 
when we start to think of who does this really well, who does, if you like, the the storytelling, the branding, the relationship piece really well, mm -hmm. it, even those of us who have been involved in the sector for a long time, we struggle to come up with a lot of people who do that. It is the exception. So what well, I was just going to say there, Will, so, I mean, for an in-house team and a, and a corporate employer, I had a really interesting chat with Cassia, actually. She's in, I think she's in just now, uh, yesterday on LinkedIn yeah. about uh, how... Um, you know, corporate employers will sell on, uh, obviously, sell on culture, which is totally the right thing to do. They can, they can, they can advertise their culture. They can give you an insight into what a culture in an organisation is like. I, I think, I, actually, Cameron, I think the word we need to question is selling. Yes. Well, yeah, you're right. And, yeah, and it's that selling thing. If we're having to sell cultures or sell jobs or sell matches or sell opportunities, we're kind of talking to the wrong people. So how do how do the age how does the agency market disrupt that and get to get the culture across of their clients better then to to improve on that? Well, you can't really. It, it, it's not a it's not a one hit thing. It, it's no. not a one job. One. Let me tell you about our culture. We're really fantastic. We we all have, we have a football machine and we all go for a beer on a Friday and that kind of thing. It, it, it's a, it, it's a longer term. It's a longer term influence. It, 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 it's visibility, yeah. um, and, and actually, increasingly, what we're finding is even when you even when you look in house, um, if you separate out candidates and applicants as two separate things, which, which is the way that I I look at the world, candidates are all those people who are connected with you and are interested, in, and they might be doing that in a formal way through something like a a, a talent network or a talent community, or they might be doing that in a, um, or, or, or they might be doing that in a, in a, 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 in an informal way, like belonging to a LinkedIn group or following someone on Twitter or, or just connecting with a number of employees. They may not even have signed up for anything, but they've begun to connect with more employees of a certain company. You know, when we, when we look at the Merlin data behind LinkedIn, that's the pattern that we see people who become employees begin that journey by, looking at and connecting with employees who do a job like them. Yeah. It, it's a relationship over time. The key is when do people want to talk to recruiters, not till they want to be applicants. Right? Yeah. So the point at which you go, there is a job, I'm interested in that job, I'd like to apply for that job, is when you become interested in the recruiter piece. That doesn't matter. And the recruiter conversation. That doesn't matter whether it's um, – in-house, out-house, or any other kind of house you want to apply to the discussion. It, it, that that point happens when you go, now I've seen a job. Now I'm ready to apply for that specific job. I want to talk to a recruiter about how do I get in the pipeline? What are the things am I going to have to do? What's that process going to be? Okay, but you've got to acknowledge the fact that a candidate will come in to a recruitment agency and they will ask that recruitment agency their opinion on the various different brands or companies and what's it like to work on there because that agency has uh, an invaluable insight as to what the differences are at certain clients. I do remember knowing that if somebody came in saying that, you know, they actually needed to get home at five o'clock, they needed this, they were looking for more of a work balance but wanted to add value. There are certain clients that I knew had an expectation that they would have their culture, work hard, play hard. They would be here till nine o'clock if needs be. That person's not going to suit it. And so no matter what the story is for that sort of client telling them, because they wouldn't admit the fact that they kept their employees there for a very long time in the evenings, the agency there is to give an acknowledgement of what the different cultures and what the different stories are of those 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 clients and they are in a unique position to be able to compare and find the best for the candidate um, well a, a few questions on that first one is uh, the first one is does does the candidate actually come into um do they come into the office anymore you, you know you, we started that conversation where we talk about how things have changed yeah. and we said the candidate would come in and do this and you know I, i've worked in recruiting a long time around agencies for a long time and I remember that when people used to come in the office and you'd sit down and have a conversation I remember the time when um candidate supply dictated that you know I, I, I can remember when we only had four or five candidates literally and we found jobs for people not people for jobs and that is the way that we worked you know you, you you'd get three or four people you'd spend more time 
in terms of what they were looking for in terms of their career. I think what we've got now is because of the volume, the, 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 the cavernous volume of, of people um, applying for jobs, not necessarily the right people, it is a hit or miss selection of are you right for this? And, and I think definitely when you look into the candidate market, you, you talk to candidates, they um, essentially a recruitment agent will talk to them about their clients rather than the market as a whole and i, and I don't want to i don't want to lay and i think that's also what the candidate's looking for <coughs> if that they'll tend to connect with you about a job and to talk to you about a job rather than a career um you know i think this thing about people talking to recruitment agents at the moment in, in the, current, the current setup is for the most part yeah there is some retained business in the most part, the reward is for transaction. Um, as a so recruitment we... agent, you're, you're hired for two things, first past the post and speed. That, that's what you're rewarded for and that's what you're paid so, for. So do you think, though, because I, I believe that agencies, if you if that's what you believe the agencies are, are providing, do you not think that is a consequence of the, and you touched on it before, the fee structure that is in place in the market? Yeah, I, I, that, this is what I'm saying. I think I think there's a ton of reasons for it. You know, um, mm -hmm. I think the market's been created like that. I think, like anything, um, you get the service that you deserve. It, it, you know, um, um, it, and in many ways, I can remember going through the market for a long time where um, there's a lot of hiring companies who created that. That they made it a first past the post, first one to get the CV. They didn't reward um, the quality job or, or relationship, if you like. Mm -hmm. Excuse me. So I think what so I think what we're seeing, um, I, I think what we're seeing when when we're when we're looking at this is saying actually what we need to re-examine is the whole thing from what we reward, what we do, where 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 um, recruit agencies sit in that process and the service we provide, and we have to question whether um, the high contingency fee model is a sustainable and b really does provide value or not and i don't think it does mm -hmm. and i do i don't dis disagree with that um i actually you know i had a completely different fee structure that i placed um i put it into phase delivery over six months um so i was able to get a little bit it wasn't a big chunk of retainer but it was called an assured delivery so I split the, um, it, it meant that there was a commitment up front of the first six, then the second six on uh, getting a good shortlist that they were wanting to interview, then the third. So that's kind of traditional recruitment. But then I followed their probationary period, which gave them that assurance and guarantee that that person was going to um, work out. Now, I tried that in fixed fees. And at the start, you know, the, the corporate market just couldn't get their head around. They just had that perception of it's going to be a transaction. I'll just give you a percentage. So I kind of had to then change it back, keep the structure that I knew would work, but base it on the percentage of the salary because they're, that innovation, because there's a whole heap of innovation that we could be doing around fees just now and value add that we need the corporate recruiters and the agency recruiters to work a little bit more effectively in partnership recognizing each other's strength to to actually get the most out of both channels uh yeah but you know you, you people have got to go out there and be brave enough to do it mm -hmm. um and we're, we're talking about a sector which is uh, very adverse to change and i think um takes a position of feeling embattled by all different things people are, are, are talking about about this is going to die this is going to live this is going to change in that there's an embattlement of saying oh it's corporate versus in-house it's um it's standoff every time you have a conversation you'll get um, a whole chunk of people from an agency side saying why well, in-house corporate recruiters are um inefficient or a waste of time and if you go to a an in-house group you'll have exactly the same conversation in reverse about while well, it's why, why, why it's too expensive, and I, and I don't think there's enough. I think we lack certain things. I think we lack um, significant leadership from our trade bodies um, and industry associations who don't, um, who have all the wrong conversations uh, for the most part. And don't. What, what, com what conversations do you think that they should be having with their members? I think we, sh I think we should be talking a lot more about uh, and understanding a lot more about change um, about. Uh, and we've only got to look at it and say, uh, I think we should be talking a lot more about um, 
what fee structures should be, what kind of services could be offered, whether um, wh whether the sector is relevant in its current format. And if we begin to say, no, actually, it's not relevant in its current format, that's when we need to then challenge and say, OK, what, what do we need to be and where do we need to go? So I think we can have much more aggressive and open conversation if we were um, a mutual society of backslappers saying how great we're doing. And that's really what I see from the from the trade associations, if I'm honest. And, okay. and I don't think it, it's kind of one or the other. I think they do a, a serious disservice to their members in the way they're conducting their message. And in and, and your opinion, Bill, what... Very much sponsor in that event again, but then... <laughs> <laughs> We're supporting our event, yes. <laughs> and in, in, uh, in your opinion, Bill, what, what services do you think uh, agencies should be offering now then? Well, I think we have to. I think we have to look at everything that could be offered, right? Mm -hmm. So, where's the expertise? Um, so, there's. A, first of all, we can break the process into parts, and start looking at saying maybe there's parts of expertise that could be paid for. I, I think there's a massive opportunity to do things like um, uh, take on the ATS and run the whole relationship process. Mm -hmm. um, run the whole relationship process with people. I think there is opportunities in branding. I think there is opportunities in interviewing. I think there's opportunities in training. There's opportunities in selection. A another model that I've looked at is this lifelong fee where you pay a fee forever for someone. Um, another big area where I think I, I see a huge opportunity, which I see very, very few people, if any, um, exploiting is if you've run an agency for 10, 15, 20 years, um, you've probably got something like 200, 250,000 CVs, maybe more yeah. um, in your database. You're still keeping them as databases and looking at them as individual transactions. I think to use the data in the business on a consulting basis of saying, actually, um, we reach a point where we've talked to most of the people in the sector. We can do things like market mapping. We can do things like salaries. We can, and we, and rather than giving opinions, this is what I think. This is why I think this job isn't paying the right money. This is why you can't hire. This is typically where these people can come from. If you've got that volume of CVs, you can take a real lead on that over consultancy yeah. and over going out and providing um, very different services in in the marketplace i think there's lifelong fees i think there's all kinds of things i think what we've got to do is um try and reinvent rather than shape shift um I, and that's where i was going in is that there are a lot of things that we and i okay we we use the example of the story there but just as you've broken it down there exactly those are sort of unhidden assets that an agency has and they've probably been doing some of it to a certain extent but they could really be enhancing those um, services and offering them in partnership with the, the corporate in-house teams. Um, and I, I love I think, have, I think you have to go further than that, Wendy. I think what you have to do, and this is why I see the RP. So so what, what what's happened is, if, if, if we look typically, um, one of the organisations I work with, historically, when they originally looked at it, 80% of their hiring was done through agency. It was kind of like a default. It was just something that you did. And yeah. the hiring that went on was what I'd call repetitive hiring. It was very similar people for high volume roles. Yeah. Um, and it took some of the tediousness, if you want to call it that, out of recruiting and, and some of the day to day stuff. Um, and the 20 percent, the very specialized stuff was what they felt they could do themselves. Uh, what, what's happened is that model's reversed where we've got actually we could set up a team to deal with this 80 percent. And we go out for the exceptional specialist stuff, the, the, the 20 percent. Mm -hmm. um, and, and let's let's re-examine what we're willing to pay for rather than pay in, in default we'll pay for real genuine specialist knowledge expertise consultancy help we're, we're willing to pay that and you don't have to question whether actually paying that on a contingency model is yeah i i like don't see how that fits either way to go or whether you yeah. whether you need to change your whole service from being retained whether it, whether it's advisory whether it's um and, and that's where i think what we've seen is more and more organizations said actually we want to bring our recruiting in-house we're not quite ready for the volume stuff and they've gone down the rpo route and that's why rpo's grown when they've gone mm -hmm. within an rpo you could have much more control over brand um we still if you like 
own the relationship the, the relationship isn't they haven't outsourced the relationship with people mm -hmm. right you know um, so could agent could it build on that then could agencies almost be um renting their recruiters on site to clients for a period of time well yeah and we're seeing that you know we're seeing some technology like recruit loop where um parts of the service it, it, you might be applying sourcing you might be doing recruiting you might be doing shortlisting you might be doing phone interviews you might be doing candidate experience communications that, that there's any numbers of parts of the recruiting process where um years and years of expertise and knowledge and data could be applied if we rethink what it is we do um, mm -hmm. I, I i very rarely see or hear anyone um you know even if you go to the recruiter agency conferences i very rarely hear anyone say anything other than the placement model mm -hmm. but, no and i i, 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 I think we're on the same yeah, not, definitely it's, just enough, same it's just not enough conversation so i think to to be relevant it's the time to rethink about all the pieces that you could do um, yeah. and not just make not not just make it rent a recruiter and i think so, every every single recruitment agency needs to think like an rpo yeah so let's take that model then right and this doesn't actually matter then if it's in-house or it's agency what does a recruitment team for the future look like well i think what you've got is it is it, 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 very different structure in terms of um what recruiters are and what recruiters do i see um i, I see recruiters entirely as project managers essentially mm -hmm. um, okay. I, I think hiring is project management it, it, it's got all the characteristics what you've got is tasks that have to be completed those tasks have to be completed in a certain order those tasks are owned by someone there's a bit of budget for it and all those tasks have to be completed in order for someone to become an employee which if you like we could say at the end of that <coughs> project base is um at the end of that project base is something like uh, uh, onboarding when, when someone joins a company or completes their probation or, or whatever stage you want to apply. Um, I think the uh, from a talent acquisition point of view, you can own the um, you can own the time to present and be held accountable for that. You can own the quality of those presentations um, mm -hmm. to some extent. There, there are other factors involved. And then after that, you own the project, not the outcome, because ultimately that's with hiring managers, hiring managers who make choices, hiring managers who manage process. But you can manage that process by making it visible and making it clear. So what, what, where I think we're going to ultimately end up, um, because the other thing which has a major impact on this, and I think will have a will have a major um, impact on both in-house and, and uh, external third party is the um, it, it, it's going to be the impact of the lifelong candidate, the lifelong relationship with the candidate, which is another project I'm working on. Which, which does mean that the candidate comes back to the people that are helpful for them time and a time again. Except, and I, except, still except that, that, I still think that, that happens. No, no when, when the, except, right. And, well, look, Bill Bill. Except that um, I, I don't fully agree. I, I don't fully agree with that. Um, because uh, it, it's not a case of continually going back to the same people. It's a case of being a. It, what's important is retention of relationship, mm -hmm. not retention of employment. Right. That's what we're seeing. That uh, the same person will work. So you might you 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 won't go and work for a company now and wait until you get a clock. You, you won't go and work for a company. And, and stay there forever right um however what we're seeing is you might work you'll work for that company multiple times you'll work on projects you'll do multiple things which changes which changes what you do it moves everything back into this project management and relationship at the moment who deals with relationship so do you think then bill in that instance then that recruitment agencies and recruiters need to change the way they manage the relationships with their clients then yeah, definitely. Um, and who their clients are. Okay. Is that your dog? <laughs> right. So, so that that's the starting point. Who the clients actually are is yeah. the beginning of that. Sorry, the postman just called. Um, <laughs> who 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 the who the who the clients actually are. You know, who are the um, feet? 
it, is it the Czech signers? Is it somebody else? Is it the candidates? And it's it, it's how what that relationship looks like. And, and I know, you know, from running agencies, if you would have been spending time repeatedly going back to people who were never really looking for a job, you'd be shifted on from that task pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, and if I give you an example of that, I think one of the key things, um, one of the key things recruiters need to do now is network without objective and network every day. Um, it's one of the things I'm going to be speaking about. I was going to say that's your, do you want to give yeah. us a wee flavour of what you're going to be talking about? Yeah. It, well, it's networking without objective, right? So I, I think we, it, whenever I see a lot of people, but what, what I've seen is most people who talk about networking within the agency sector um, have done that, have really just said, this is the way we used to network when we used to pick the phone up or we used to go to networking events. We've now gone digital and we're going to do the, exactly the same thing, mm. right? So I think most people network almost like they walk into a conference room, they have a list of people they want to meet, they're looking at everyone's name badge and saying, who are they? Is this person important? Is this person not important? They're trying to very quickly qualify people into, is this a candidate? Is this a client? If not, this is a wasted conversation or, or, or a wasted effort. Um, spending increasing as we become digital um spending no time on being personal right um mm -hmm. and, and that really that really makes them automations or they network like robots right mm -hmm. and, and so for me um it drives me absolutely nuts so i think the, the, there's certain things that are absolutely key one is to network without objective which is to go look for conversations that are interesting and be a part of those conversations and not try and qualify people as not go looking for clients or candidates, but interesting conversations, interesting topics and be a part of that because you can only benefit from a network when you're part of a network. So, I've, you know, too many people run networks as sales lists. Yeah. Want to find sales lists. And so I'm going to talk a lot about why, um, why we need to focus on that and the fact that relationship relationships are built on sharing shit, right? Um, you know, if you look at any, any, um, Hopefully not literally, but yes. But yeah, you know, if you look, if you look at any networking group, if you look at any community, um, relationships are built on people. People, you know, if, if, I, I write hopefully great pieces that could change the world of recruitment. Three people like it, two people share it. I get my beard shaved, that a hundred people do. <laughs> yeah. Sector, you know, they like it and share it. So, and when I think about how relationships build with people, you, you really apply the rules of the pub to networking when i think about how relationships are built with people um the stronger the relationship the less we talk about business yeah yes that's absolutely and, correct and the more it's involved in rubbish and business is a consequence of that yes and i think with all of our monitoring and targets and talks right what we're doing is we, we're really trying to enforce this. Let's go and be a thought leader. Let's talk really intelligently in the market. Now, let's not do that. Let's go and talk about cats and football and X Factor. And, <laughs> and you know, let, let, let's be friends with people and figure out you know where and when it's appropriate for us to do business. And I, and I think that's that that that's it's a lesson. More so, recruitment owners need to earn. Uh, need to learn them recruiters because they've got all these great gurus saying no you need to have your target audience and you need to segment these people in this way and they need to be clients or they need to be candidates and you need to not share any pictures of cats and not do this and not do that and it's just rubbish it's just absolute it's absolute it's absolute nonsense we need to network like we're in the pub and then um and then we can begin to build the right relationships and, and it's as much about how how do i be a part of this this network and, and make it work so that's what i'm going to talk about which is going to be that, that sounds amazing so basically anybody that's coming to our event next wednesday it's they're the going to come and they're, they're, they're going to make the friends <laughs> they're going to share some shits <laughs> and, yeah. and they're going to go to the pub in the middle of the day brilliant so um <laughs> so it's like a great day uh, <laughs> matt buckland's put in um, isn't isn't networking oh it's just came off my screen now. hang on um isn't networking without purpose um just being friendly people are turned off by being sold to um that's why products like adblock and tivo exist yeah when does being friendly have to be a tactic yeah when, when does it have to be a strategy when, when do we have to go right we're going to take you on a training course to learn to be friendly i think the other thing people try and do is 
um, try and be too neutral and popular. Right? Mm -hmm. So, and, and I can tell you, I'll, I'll sit in these sessions and people, I'll read the books and people go, right, rule number one of social media, rule number one of networking, you've got to be authentic. Rule number two, here's, this is how you be a personal brand. These are the things you don't do. These are the things you don't talk about. Kind of how, how do we be authentic and not be a real person, not just be a real person out there doing what we doing what we have to do. And I, I think that's that's one of the things you've got to do is when we talk about just being friendly, just talking to people, um, being be, being authentic means that you're going to upset a load of people, and a load of people are going to like you because you're going to be truthful about yourself and about the things. You, the things you need and the things you believe and, and, and if you don't upset a few people sometimes you're doing it wrong and, and i think too many people are setting themselves out as being um being vanilla um trying to be thought leaders to just say Let, let's just go out there and talk about the things i think about and some people will like that and some people will hate that but that's fine because the, the worst the worst thing we the worst disservice we do um to students and, and graduates and so on is to go and tell them to clean up their online profiles because we go and say to them clean up your online profile um make yourself look like something that you're not so that you might accidentally get a job which you're going to hate right and, and that's generally the message that we we put out in the market pretend to be something else because that's great for your brand that's great for your brand need to get rid of all that nonsense and say you know this is this, this is just um poor marketing nonsense really you need to go out and tell people to be real be authentic have conversations and the places where business will will happen will naturally happen as a consequence of <laughs> i just see so stephen adorno's just said here the 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 very best networkers make me feel important and heard but are you basically saying <laughs> that actually it's the ones that you argue with <laughs> Um, but that's part of being important and heard, right? I'm not sure if Stephen would be feeling respect, good about that. You know, it's arguing with respect and it's doing it with, it, it, it's accepting that everybody everybody has a viewpoint. Yeah. yeah. You know, um, every, everyone, for me, everyone's entitled to be wrong. You know, so everyone's entitled to come out and say, this is what I think. And it, it's what the whole truth thing is about. If you're speaking with, um, if you're speaking with, uh, respect if you're listening to people's opinions if you're coming back uh you know i'd say if you look from the outside um some of the best conversations i have some of the best things i learn some of the best ways i go away and re-examine what i do is when people really um challenge you aggressively yeah. challenge my views and, and and say you know why do you think that and what because what, that's what we do in the pub right we'd all have a beer and we'd say that i think that's rubbish and i think that's nonsense we'd say right let's let's have a chat about it and somewhere in the middle i'm going to form an opinion um yeah. no, and, to, and to be fair you know i think that's part of who you are because i know i can have a really good debate with you um and a lot of people do in true um but you do you do challenge the norm and you you may not agree with everything you say, but you go away thinking about it, and 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 I I do think that's that's a really yeah, but good it's never personal, quality. right? That, that's no, it's bit, never. That, that's it, the bit it, I it, think people have to learn is it it's never personal, and you never yeah. deliver it in a personal way. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's what's what's hard for people. You don't deliver it in a personal way, but you. Deliver, that is a hard balance, isn't it, for yeah. people to be able to sort of relearn? Yeah, you, you're not delivering it in a personal way. What you're doing is. Um, mm -hmm attacking the idea or the concept you're applying a bit of humor you know you have to have um some broad shoulders sometimes when you put stuff out there but you you know and, and i see a lot of people who put stuff out there and say this is me and i'm gonna blog and i'm gonna write a post and all the rest of it and as soon as someone attacks it they suddenly go i'm being bullied i'm being bullied this is terrible mm -hmm. and the trolls have come out and this is really bad you know i i i, I welcome that you know i every time i put something out um, the worst thing that could ever happen to me is to have no reaction. I, I, well, it does. Yeah, an emotional react reaction, yeah. negative or positive, means you've had a reaction, which which is brilliant. Out of it, out of interest, and I know Cami will be sort of looking at um, drawing this to close, but you have uh, another um, insight because you are going through all the various different cities around the world and yeah. you're talking to recruiters. So where do you see the UK in terms of the rest of the world? You know, is it the same stuff? Um, do you think that we're still doing things differently um you know how, how do we rate up 
it's 80 percent of the same stuff mm -hmm. right so 80 percent of the conversation wherever you go is roughly the same it might manifest itself in slightly different ways but Generally, you're talking about talent shortages, skills, what's going to happen with the world of work, what's going on with the gig economy, how do you brand yourself, all that kind of thing. Um, so 80% of the conversation is roughly the same. 20% um, is the local bit that says, actually, it's different here. Um, and, and you can go as micro on that as you want. So I know from having run um, True Glasgow and True Edinburgh, as an example, mm -hmm. you know, that's somewhere that there's not a lot of miles apart. If you look at the globe and you'd be easy to think that's just the jocks. They're all like jocks are like that. That's how they behave. And then you, you go to Edinburgh and Glasgow and you go, there's a completely different flavor. If I was yeah. networking here or delivering a message or trying to do business in this market, it'd be quite different if I was in Glasgow to if I was in Coke Bridge to Falkirk to Aberdeen, wherever it is. So I think you learn to say, right, here's the 80 percent. But the bit I'm really interested in, which is why I like to love to travel and, and talk to lots of people is what's the 20 percent what is mm -hmm. what do we perceive as being different and what really is different what is different about doing this here sometimes the method might be the same but the delivery will be slightly different sometimes okay. it's actually sometimes it's actually quite different over um sometimes it's quite different over there might be a law there might be a geography there might be a skill shortage what what actually happens here how do i deliver this <laughs> excuse me how do i deliver this locally okay cool from your travels bill do you think there's anything that the uk market could adopt um that other, uh, perhaps? absolutely i mean i have a scale of where i look um for inspiration i think um i think the uk as a whole is probably 18 months to two years ahead of the us in most things Mm -hmm. um, I think within Europe, I probably put places like um, the Netherlands and um, some of the emerging places like Hungary and places like that as being ahead of the UK. If I was looking oh, at Europe, Europe as a whole, um, you know, because I think that there are emerging markets in modern technology in the modern market yeah mm -hmm. so as an example when i went to poland um uh, ran a event in warsaw through warsaw a few years ago and we're going to repeat that again at the time i was going to a lot of conferences and we were talking about mobile mm -hmm. uh, as being a thing and we were running conferences on mobile and recruitment and all this kind of stuff um and then uh i actually went to a conference for two days and i said i was really surprised you didn't have any speakers talking about mobile and they went is that a thing uh, is it a thing so what do you mean? They went, well, we just build for mobile. Like, everyone's on mobile and we just build for it. We, and they were kind of looking at me and saying, really, like you you talk about that for a couple of days. You have people come in. Don't, isn't it just like what you do? Yeah. And, and I think what we're seeing is the emerging markets are emerging into the new world. So they're building for that. They're building for today. I think what the problem is with any of the traditional historical markets like the US, like the UK, is that um, we most of what we do in technology and methodology is trying to fix problems which aren't going to be problems. So by the time people are talking about it being an issue and somebody are actually doing something about it, right? Um, it's no longer an issue. We've moved on to something else. We've moved on to something different. We have a new problem. So I think the people who are living in today's problems rather than problems of the past about that political structure there's a lot more to be learned in terms of innovation and change in, in that respect um the place i go for the most inspiration is new zealand i think new zealand's about three years ahead of any man hmm. yeah uh, I, I, you know and i think we're we're about 18 months two years ahead of the us we just make less noise i think that's a really good statement and i, I agree and think the new zealand markets are an exciting place just now yeah, that's that's where I go. That's where I go if I want, and that's where I talk to people if I want to um, see what's new. So all the new stuff that I'm seeing, like using non-recruiting technologies like Slack, DocuSign, Trello, stuff like that, I was seeing that in New Zealand two to three years ago. Years ago. Whereas I'm seeing it now as a thing mm -hmm. in yeah. the UK market. So, 
So, Excellent. I want to, um, I'm just conscious of the time, so I want to um, just finish off by asking you uh, one one more question, but I know we, can, we touched on, on this a little bit earlier on, but um, I want to ask you, um, do, do you think there do you think there is a future for recruitment agencies? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm completely. I just don't think it'll necessarily be. I, I think what it'll be is something quite different in that we charge for services, we sell data. We're already seeing some companies that used to be agencies that aren't agencies anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you, know, you, you see that whole load of things from the job post to um, um, talent networks, the talent networks guys at uh, Northampton that, that, that run the biggest talent mapping company to yep. um, in Scotland, you've got like, social media job search out of Norman Broadbent that, that are doing pure sourcing. You've got people sourcing crew that Gordon's yep. running in Amsterdam. So we're beginning to see them. I think the problem we have is the bubble that, that we live in. People who talk about and interested in this stuff is 1% of the one percent of the global recruiter population, you know. So we see lots of examples of people doing things different and think, oh, people are doing something different when actually that's why the only person we can reel out is Steve Ward and say, yeah, look at Steve Ward, he's great. So do you think they're not? <laughs> um, so I think, and so I think, yeah, there is a future. I, I think the future is change. I would advise people, you know, business is pretty healthy at the moment. Yeah. Um, and that's the perfect, the perfect time to change is when you don't have to. When you don't have to, you'll change because it's the right thing. You know, when everything's going perfectly, that's the perfect time to try and change something. Don't adopt this old agency attitude and stick your head in the sand and say, if it's not broke, don't fix it. We're only going to do anything about it when when the money runs out, because then it's too late. So do you think then, yeah, so do you think then, Bill, that off of the back of that, that if, see if, if, if they don't start to change now, do you think they'll just get left behind? Well, I don't think it's that. I think it's we. I think we're all in this together, really. You know, we've all got a vested state. So let's not talk about that. I don't think it matters whether we're a... This is part of the modern way of working, is it doesn't matter whether you're a software company, a job board, an agency, third-party recruit. We're actually in this same issue, Space. which is how do we, how do we create work and, and make things work right? And, and we genuinely have to think of it as a we. It's it's more than, yeah. more, more than just words. Um, but, but I think... It, it we we can work we can work with that we can you know we can we, we can actually make change um, together we can start thinking about things and experimenting in new things and I want to see more people doing that and I, and I don't think um, and I'd like to see us serve better at doing that by the trade bodies by mm -hmm. um, not not spending money on old training, you know, not going to old training of teaching the same thing, smile and dial and pick the phone up and talk to 50 people a day, which I'm still seeing rolled out everywhere. Um, yeah. Not watching things like Top Recruiter with shambolic stuff, which is coming over to the UK, not wasting our time doing that, but actually thinking about how we really do something different. Yeah. Great. Phil, thanks very much. There's loads of value to take away from this today. Really, really appreciate you making the, the, the time out. And, uh, no it's a pleasure. Wendy's giving you the hat tip there. Really, really looking forward to seeing you um, in Glasgow on the 1st of June as well at the Predictive Recruitment event. It's going to be exciting and we might upset some people. <laughs> <laughs> no, you promised friends and going to the pub. So. Yeah. <laughs> get, get your complaint stuff ready. I'll yeah, talk to you later. A big thanks, thanks to everyone for, for, for tuning in as well. Really appreciate it. Thanks very much. See you later, guys. Thanks, Bill. Bye, thanks everybody. a lot. Cheers. Bye. Thanks, guys. Cheers for joining us.